How's it going guys? So many videos to edit, so little time. I wanna thank you guys so much for your support. I'm up to 2,500 subscribers. Couldn't do it without you. Thanks so much for watching. Got a whole bunch of videos coming out in the next couple of weeks. In the meantime, I want to show you this podcast that I did with my friend John from Cast and Spear back in December, 2019. Thank you, John, so much for putting that together, for inviting me onto your show. Make sure you check out his website and his YouTube channel. I'll have them linked below. A lot of good information, really unique content. Be sure to check it out. So I hope you enjoy the podcast. It's who I am, why I fish, and also just sharing some of the techniques that I like to utilize when fishing. Thanks so much for checking it out, guys. Tight lines. Hey, what's up, everyone? John here from the Cast and Spear Podcast, and today we have Benji Kim from Benji Kim Fishing. He has an up-and-coming light line surf fishing channel that you can find on YouTube and Instagram. In this podcast, he goes over what is light line surf fishing, who inspired him, how you can get started doing it, and so much more. So without further ado, please welcome Benji Kim. Today we have Benji Kim from Benji Kim Fishing. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. I've been following your work for some time and I love it. I thought if you could just give people a little quick introduction of how you got interested in fishing and we'll go from there. Yeah, for sure. Um, Yeah. So, you know, I, I, my dad never took me fishing. He wasn't the outdoors type, but I started fishing when I was a kid with my two cousins, Andy and Richard. And uh, my uncle, Richard's dad would take us out. And I, I remember we went out um, as kids, probably we're probably like no more than six or seven out to Lake Cuyamaca yeah, yeah. in San Diego. And um, my cousin Andy caught a largemouth bass on a night crawler off of off our little rental skiff. And I, it was somewhere around that time where that addiction was born, you know, where just the love of chasing that tug. And um, for us, we were still in an age where you just drop us off at the park and we're like young kids. We probably shouldn't be dropped off there. <laughs> and, you know, taking our cheap, you know, Walmart gear, um, the cheapest possible and probably tying shoe knots, you know, to, to tie our stuff. Like no one taught us anything. And we'd go to the regional parks, Irvine regional. I lived two miles from Irvine regional park and we'd go there and have uh, bluegill catching contests. And, um, and then somewhere down the line, um, our parents took us up to the high Sierras to Bishop area and we do trout fishing. And that was crazy. We we're like, Oh my God, we're, you know, we're just catching stalkers, but it's like wide open up there. And so um, somewhere down the line, um, I grew up doing that. And then um, somewhere down the line, I was just into sports. Uh, you know, I was a baseball player and I was just a sports junkie. I loved playing basketball. And um, so I stopped fishing as much. My two cousins kept going, which is why they're way better than me because um, they just, you know, they, they kept going with the fishing. And I still did it like maybe once or twice a year, but it wasn't something that I was really into when I became like a young adult. And, um, and then from there, um, you know, I graduated from UC Irvine, uh, majored in English and my dad was actually a preacher. So I was, I'm a preacher's kid. And, um, and so that was actually what I was passionate about too. You know, just following my dad's footsteps. I grew up super religious, um, very conservative, um, uh, conservative churchgoer. And, uh, and so after I graduated, I actually got my master in divinity, um, from seminary and I became a preacher too. So I... I did that for about 10 years. That was really like what my life calling was um, when I was a kid. It was like really what I was passionate about. And I really cared about the church and all that stuff. And so um, for about 10 years, um, I did that. I did did it to the best of my ability. Um, Had some good times, had some bad times. And by the end, um, things were... Things at my organization, um, it was difficult, didn't end too well, uh, maybe similar to what you were telling me about, you know, your startup experience. And uh, I was I was burned out um, and disillusioned. And, you know, I still have my faith, but I uh, just wasn't sure that that's what I want to do as my occupation. So that was probably about six years ago, I'm guessing, maybe about six years ago. And then after that, all my training was in nonprofit and I have a degree in, I have a master's in theology. Like, what do you do with that? Right. Mm -hmm, Right. And so it was around that time, um, probably about six years ago where I was like, man, you know what I miss? I miss fishing. Uh, I, I just, I just miss it. And so I called my cousin up and I'm like, yo, I want to get some better gear, you know, better gear from when I was a kid, you know, like set me up because by this time his garage was filled, um, with really nice stuff. And I was like, yo, hook me up, tell me what to get. And I just started fishing again. Um, I picked up like one little decent combo and I was hitting the local parks. And um, around that time, 
So during that transitional time in my life where I was disillusioned, I was kind of seeking out that hobby. And, um, and then I got into surf fishing because the local parks, you know, I know guys are pretty good at fishing those parks, but to me, like it's high pressured and not the easiest fishing and, um, Irvine Lake at the time had closed down and that was like the one local lake that I liked to fish. And so I was like, dude, where do I fish? Like, what, where do I go? And it just hit me. It's like, oh, the beach, like the beach is everywhere. And so, and there's just so much real estate and I feel like the possibilities are endless. So, um, yeah, I just, I had never surf fished before. Like I had seen like some of my cousins do it. I'd never surf fished before. And I'm like, yo, let's, let's do, you know, that, that's what I'm going to start doing. And, uh, so that led me down the path and, um, you know, I, I left my organization so, sort of simultaneous to that. And, um, during, for about a two year period, I sold paint. Um, I, I took a retail job as a management trainee and I ran a Sherwin Williams paint store for two years. I did well, you know, like we, um, I hit president's club, you know, my, 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 my first year as a manager cleaned up. Um, they offered me a promotion to become a sales rep and it was in my president's hotel suite at the end of that, that reward trip that I got where they offered me the, the promotion and they needed an answer. I sat in my hotel room and I'm like, dude, I can't do this. Um, I, I just, I just can't keep going with this. Um, I had three, three young kids at home. My wife works full time mm -hmm. and uh, she was also, she also has a network marketing business that was starting to blow up. And for two years, I, we would argue because I'm like, dude, this is a waste of time. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And she stuck with it, you know, like despite all the arguments, despite the lack of profits, like she just grinded, 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 grinded. And then we we're starting to see money from it, like a decent amount where it was matching my salary in my 60 hour a week corporate job, retail job, you know? So, and you know, I've got three little ones. Uh, we don't even know who was watching them. <laughs> so, so I was like, yo, you know what? This isn't worth it. I think we could live off of what you're making right now, um, in your day job and with this side gig. And, um, so yeah, I quit my job, um, in that hotel room. I called my boss in the hotel room and said, yo, um, I'm not taking the promotion and I'm putting in my two weeks. <laughs> That's awesome, so, man. Um, yeah, man. So props to her. Yeah. Props to her for starting that and sticking with it. Yeah, yeah. the grind is real, and dude, it's impressive. Yeah, I've I've learned so much from watching her because neither of us have ever really been entrepreneurial. Like we've just been we've just grown up working for the man, you know, and and just working. And so for her to really push past all of those, you know what I'm talking about, all of those things that come up, obstacles. Um, and just over choosing to overcome, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Not everything works out. So, um, to to yeah, she's really paved the way for that. And uh, for me, um, as a stay at home dad, then it just I take I do all the kid stuff, and in between that, I would just fish. And um, that those first that first year and a half, two years, I was just fishing, and trying to figure out surf fishing and the particular technique that I was learning how to do, and um, just fishing, fishing, fishing. And it was probably about a year and a half. Ago, Last year, last December, uh, I was like, yo, and it, all the business aspects and the possibilities of doing this like as my vocation career and aiming to really make this a profitable thing where I could live off of it, it was always in the back of my head. Like, oh man, I would love to start a YouTube, but, and you know, how many people think that and never do it? And that was in my head. Um, and oh, I, I should do it. I should start up an Instagram. I, I need to start, you know, utilizing social media. But for a year and a half, I did nothing. I just fished, fished, fished. And it was last December 18th, where just on a whim, like, yo, let's start an Instagram, you know? So I started my my fishing Instagram, Benji Kim Fishing, from scratch, and just started growing that. And then in May, I had a similar kind of on a whim, like, dude, let's just do the YouTube like let's just do it and so put up a first like lame video <laughs> you know just just to do it you yeah. know um and coincidentally it was my two with my two cousins bass fishing mm -hmm. you know and um it's cool it's kind of brought us back together this past year since all three of us are still fish are fishing now you know and uh yeah it was kind of from there it's like okay the, in the instagram has been steadily growing um the youtube is starting to grow you know and it's starting to push so it's like hey 
let's let's see this through and um keep going and so i've been able to meet you know cool people like you hey man yeah cool people like you <laughs> well my question is when you're going fishing for that um first year uh with when you're watching your kids did you bring them with you or did you leave them with the, the grandparents and then you fished or just wake up really early before the wife goes to work how did you s- sneak that in um yeah so i would uh i do i make all the meals in my house so wake up cook breakfast get them all to their respective schools and then from the moment i drop them off to school to the moment i had to pick the first one up that's primarily my fishing time nice um that that's when i would do it and that's still what i do because um i at a certain point i think it's going to stretch us when i want when i really want to take a step forward with what i'm doing but for now it's just been fitting it in in fitting it into our schedule in a way that doesn't affect any of them you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, outside of me not cleaning when they're at school, but <laughs> so. Yeah. And then for fishing, um, have you? What have you learned in the surfish uh, while surf fishing? Um, there's fish out there, and there there's big fish out there, and uh, you just got to know how to target them. And I love the beach, and I love surf fishing because water is always changing, and it's one thing, it's one thing to go to a lake and figure out that lake. And pretty much it's always going to be like that, you know, more or less. Um, but the beach, you have to be adaptive. And so to me, that's where it really spurs my competitive side. It's like, yo, you really have to know what you're doing. You really have to adapt to the situations and the, and the, um, you have to really have to adapt to what it is that day, you know, the weather, the wind, um, the tide and the beach can change overnight, you know, in terms of where the fish are holding. So, um, it really brings out the hunter mentality. Um, you really got to, you really got to know where to go, um, and figure out that bite. So that's, yeah, that's, that's a really good, fun. that's a good point, man. It's everything. There's so many variables for surf right. fishing, just crazy. Right. And you have to learn how to read the, the water, find the troughs, you know, the right bait, the right, uh, presenting the right, um, bait for them. It's, it's pretty crazy. So what do you yeah. like to go after? Do you like to go after Corvina? Do you like to just sharks? What do you like to go? Right. So I'm a, um, I actually specialize in a, it's a pretty niche thing here in Southern California, but it's light line surf fishing. So we use, um, ultra light gear, um, like salmon steelhead rods, um, super sensitive actions and tips. Um, and there are guys that use two pound leaders. Um, but I, I use four pound. Um, I use ex- pretty much exclusively four pound test, um, four pound leader, and I'll use like a six pound main line. But, um, the species that really captured my heart and my passion was Corbina. Um, and that, that was the one fish that I've spent now probably the past four years trying to figure out. And I would say that in the first three years I had success, but not really. Like I caught a lot of them, but a hundred percent of them were on the smaller side. Um, what I mean by that is like 18 inches and below. You know, but the mass majority of the Corbin I caught in those three years, like the entire time was, you know, like 15 to 18 inches. And I probably caught a couple hundred of them, but I, I really wanted that 20 inch fish, you know, and it wasn't until this year, um, 2019, where I started seeing results. So I, I don't know, like, I think it's a combination of figuring it out, but it's all and, and also like luck, you know, like, but I think that's what hopefully what good fishermen do is they put the odds in their favor. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you're getting the reps in and that's the hardest yeah. part, right? It's especially if you're yeah. getting to go during the week where most people, you know, are weekend warriors or, or whatnot, you're getting those reps and you're able to get that feedback. Is there anything that yeah. you can shed some light on for some of the guys who might not be able to go as much, but you, not all your secrets, but do you have any kind of right. like patterns that you're right. seeing? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I think the only thing that I probably am like hesitant to share is like spots. Oh, for and sure. That's like a whole. That's like a whole debate that we can have a conversation. And I think we've had some conversations about that too. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and I'm like in the middle. You know, like I understand the whole like spot burning drama, but at the same time, I'm on the other side too. It's like, yo, dude, calm down. You know. <laughs> so I'm a little bit of both. Um, but yeah, when it comes to light line surf fishing, um any kind of fishing really, um, I've always been told from the people that have mentored me, taught me um, how to fish and how to improve, nothing beats time on the water, right? So, um, but you just can't go out there like like just mindlessly, you know, you have to um, pay attention and learn techniques and try to apply them. Um, and there's things that you learn while on the sand that you don't even know you're learning. Um, but 
it's through that repetition of just time on the water. Like, and I found that to be true. Nothing beats time on the water. It's to learn. And you also have to be actively learning. You know, for me, I joined a Facebook um, surf fishing group. Um, and hopefully it's okay that I make that plug. Um, yeah, dude, plug it away. Uh, well, how can people yeah, find it? Um, yeah, it's California Surf Anglers on Facebook. And I found that group just because I was searching. I wanted to learn. I was so hungry. To, to learn knowledge. So there's different forums out there that were kind of dying, more antiquated and old school, you know? And I found this face, Facebook group and it had, I think probably like over 5,000 members a couple years ago. Um, and now it's over 7,400. And so for, yeah, for that first year and a half, um, I wouldn't call, I would comment, but I didn't have anything to post. I couldn't share any of my catches cause I wasn't catching anything good, but I was just searching that group and following all the posts from more experienced guys that were just sharing their techniques on the Carolina rig, um, sand crabs, how to find sand crabs, uh, what size hooks to use, what size weight to use, um, how to identify structure, right? Like, where do you learn that? You know, like, that's not something that's readily available. It's out there, but you really got to search for it. So I would read all these things and I would see pictures and I would go on YouTube and there was a couple of good ones on YouTube from people teaching you how to identify structure. And it makes sense to me cognitively at home, but it's another thing to go on the sand and like practice it, you know? So it's learning at home and then going out there and not knowing what you're doing, but just trying. You know? There's so much to unpack right there. Cause I mean, <laughs> I agree a hundred percent. I watched a lot of videos um, from like Rich Troxler. He's like on the East yeah. coast. Uh, and that guy, he does probably one of the the best kind of like clinics when it comes to reading structure, but you can watch yep. his video or you can look at the pictures. And it's like, when you go out into the real world, you're just like, is that a trough? Is that a, yeah. what is that? I can't, I don't know. Yeah. That is, until you fish it and you're like, you're actually catching something from it. You're like, okay, now I know what it is, you know? And, and you have to do, yep. put in the homework yourself. Um, yep. No, that, that, that's very helpful. So you started, you know, eventually posting, more and more of your catches and that then people started to follow you more is that are you aren't you a moderator in that group or oh yeah so california surf angler so i was just a member um i was just a nobody member that wasn't catching anything good um and the jealousy of watching people catch their big catches just fueled me like dude i gotta get out there i gotta if he can do it i can do it you know and um so that was probably for two years, maybe a year and a half, two years. That was just what it was. But I was active. I would ask questions. How do you do this? Um, wh what do you do when it's like this? And is this okay to do? You know, like that for two years, that's what I did. Um, I was active. And then um, my friend Brian, who actually started that group, um, I he hit me up one day and he was like, hey, you want to fish together? And, you know, who am I? Like, I'm just a nobody that doesn't catch anything. You know, he invited me to fish with him and that's how I met him. And uh, that started a friendship, and shortly thereafter, he actually asked me to bring, he brought me on as part of the admin team of that group. So it's, you know, 7,400 people strong, and now, like, I get to help out with the vision of that group and helping it grow and um, hopefully just hopefully just giving back. You know, like, everything, every post that I make on there is to hopefully give back because I received a lot from people I've never met, you know? So. Absolutely. So what were the other forums that you used before you found that group? Because I know there's like SD Fish, there's a SC Surf Fishing, yeah. um, but I haven't seen too many more specific in like the light line stuff. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, SC Surf Fishing was the first forum I found. And um, there are a lot of there are a lot of old timers. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a reverential way. You know, um, old timers that have done it for a long time, extremely knowledgeable, a lot of kind people. I don't know the story of what went on i've heard things here and there but by the time i found that group it wasn't that active and so um i'd fish i'd, I'd be on there a lot like probably a couple hours a day just waiting for an update you know <laughs> and uh, um, somebody please and answer so, me <laughs> crickets, yeah yeah crickets. So, right and it's just because it just wasn't that active the i think the people that were on there were very dedicated and giving you know um so that's what eventually brought me over to um csa and it was just a much more active group. It's a very active group. So it's not just a lot of people. It's a lot of people that are engaged, you know, with what's going on. So, so yeah, can we been... uh, can we dive into a little bit of your favorite rigs and stuff for Lightline? In case somebody Absolutely. wants to get into it. 
because I know the Carolina yeah. is very popular. Um, one of my buddies always has me using the uh, spider hitch rig, but I'd love to kind of hear like what, what you recommend, especially for like Corbina yeah. and then if you have other ones for other fish. Right. Um, so, and I started, I think you asked me that like probably 10 minutes ago and I was just rambling, but um, the for light line surf fishing, um, yeah, it's, it's for light line surf fishing, I use exclusively for targeting um, what I call surf critters, which is Corbina, yellowfin croaker, um, barred surf perch. Um, those are like kind of, and then the occasional spotfin croaker if you can find them up close. Um, but those are like the surf critters that you can catch. You know, I'm not bombing out with 12 foot rods with like six ounce weights. You know, it's it's literally like just that front trough and that front break where we're targeting. Um, but I use a Carolina rig exclusively when I'm light line surf fishing. Um, I'll use um, anywhere from an eight foot six medium light. Um, so uh, one of my favorite rods that I use is a G Loomis E6X. It's a stam and steel head rod and it's their base model. Still kind of pricey, but it's a fantastic rod for the application. Um, I use anywhere from an eight foot six to like a seven foot seven uh, Phoenix feather. Um, for the rod, uh, for a reel, I use a uh, Shimano Stratic um, 3000. Um, should, you can easily get away with 2000 or 2500 series. Um, that's probably more ideal. Probably 2500 is a sweet spot for a reel size. Um, and then Carolina rig exclusively, I'll use a size 12 barrel swivel, and I'll use anywhere from a 1 8 ounce um, bullet weight or an egg sinker up to maybe a three quarter if the conditions are really you know really strong and that applies for orange county like southern california because our beaches are a little bit more forgiving um but yeah and then i'll use um a four pound leader and um right now i'm using a size eight owner mosquito hook um when i'm targeting corbina um and i know guys that use size 10 sometimes even 12 which is wow. like kind of crazy so Tiny. it's yeah, yeah. So um, that's that's what I do um, with the leader. I'll use um, anywhere from twelve to eighteen inches of leader. And um, for corbina, um, for like those critters, I'm almost always using sand crabs when they're available. Um, and you know, I like using artificial light. I, we could talk about halibut fishing too. I that's another one that's oh man, that's driven me crazy for the past couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> but um but from the light line thing um yeah i just use sand crabs and yeah i think the real fishermen out there are probably like oh you can't use live bait but for a corbina it gets a pass because they're so hard to get to bite <laughs> for the leader are you using mono or fluoro um i've switched up to exclusively fluoro cool so um right now I, it's I just like I'm kind of at a place where I want to use the best stuff, um, and so my top shot I use a six pound top shot. It's called Seaguar R18, mm -hmm. and it's not really available out here, but I you can pick it up on Amazon. Um, it's a little bit of more of expensive line, but I like it because fluoro. The knock on fluoro is it can the memory and it can be real it can be real stiff um, and doesn't have the flex that you need. And so I like the R18 because it has stretch. Um, it's it's almost reminds me of mono um it, it can stretch on you um and so it's it gives me that um because a lot of guys what they'll use is they'll use fluoro and they'll use like um a shock leader like a mono shock leader because when you're setting the hook on such a light line on a on a quality fish you're going to snap off if you don't have that flexibility um so i use uh r18 for my top shot and then i use seaguar tatsu um for my leader um, and that's my four pounds. So I just want to have like the best line because um, for me right now at this stage in my light line fishing career, it's all about getting that one bite and I want it to be a quality fish. And so if I do get that one bite, like, I want to make sure I have a chance of getting men. Absolutely. What color or bead do you use? Um, I use orange and clear. And um, to be honest with you, I've heard a lot of different theories. The orange mimics eggs, you know, and different things like that. I, I honestly don't know. Um, you haven't I seen use, a difference in terms of like bite ratio or whatever. Not for me. And if there is some sort of, if there are some stats out there, I haven't been taking notes. Um, I've I've used orange most of the past four years, and I recently, like six months ago, bought a pack of clear glass beads, um, just because. And I haven't seen an adverse effect. I get bit the same, in my opinion. So, um, but that's just me. There might be more to it than that. 
That's good to know. And then, so you start, you're talking about halibut. So that thing's been giving you a lot of problems. Are you going after them um, with bait, or are you going with like the lucky craft? Or yeah, so that's where that's that's where I'm like a contradiction because I know that with halibut, if you use live bait, and my my buddy Victor, um, he slays halibut on live bait. He catches um, smelt like off the piers, and and he just uses them. And it's like it's not automatic, but you know it's. It, it increases your chances of getting bit like exponentially, but for halibut, like I'm almost exclusively um, on artificials. So yeah, whether it be the drop shot, or a jig head, or the lucky craft, um, those are the three ways I target them. I I, I just chuckle with halibut because um, that was another thing that simultaneously fed my addiction. I was chasing corbina, and then I accidentally caught uh, like a 12 inch halibut. Um, this was four years ago, on a gulp camo worm. Um, and I was like, what, there's halibut here? Um, and I was like, yo, I'm going to catch a legal. It took me two years to catch a legal halibut. <laughs> they're hard, man. I mean, they're hard fish. <laughs> so, um, de- definitely there's a method to the madness. And I think, um, I've been told once you catch your first one, it's a lot easier to catch a second. So, um, I've caught a few this year, a few legals and, um, but my first, first legal halibut was in March. So, you know, after two years of grinding, um, yeah <laughs> congrats do you keep them or are you all strictly catch and release yeah i've i've um up to this year up to about like i think a month and a half ago i released 100 percent of my fish um i was just not not because i was standing on my high horse um but just because i don't know i didn't want to go through the trouble and i do respect the fishery and um believe in you know sustaining our sustaining our local waters um so yeah i I never kept a single one but i caught a legal halibut um i think in october and i kept that one and i made a catch and cook uh, with that one and i just thought it'd be fun you know just to do it and so kept that one and then i caught a white sea bass um i think like a month ago and that one was legal and i've been told over and over that they're the best tasting fish so um made a catch and cook with that one too <laughs> well dude let's go into that because i think you did back-to-back yc bass from shore which is a feat in itself can you talk a little <laughs> bit about that oh man you know oh yeah so uh the the way that you catch white sea bass is i have no idea man <laughs> <laughs> get lucky no yeah um it's lucky and time on the water and you know again it's putting the odds in your favor right it was luck because i didn't know that white sea bass were holding where i was fishing and um for me i've always seen white sea bass from pictures on instagram and it's like every once in a while someone's holding like this big old ghost and you know for me it, i didn't even ever have the thought like oh i would love to catch one because i don't know the first thing about how i would target them from the shore that you know people are really secretive about it especially from the surf it's one thing to go out to catalina and drop a whole squid right but um so yeah i was, I was fishing at a location targeting halibut and um it was the first time i was at that beach and um i was still in the lucky craft and we got into a, a like i was fishing with my friend and we got into a, a pretty pretty active bite um caught it like a short halibut this was like within five casts um, a short halibut, a calico bass, um, a couple of yellowfin croaker. And I don't know, if you're fishing the jerk bait, like hard baits, it's not like, I don't think it's every day where you get into like an every cast you're getting bit type of situation. So it was, yeah, it was just, we were just, we were just casting from the surf and um, I was just jerking it and I got bit by something and, um, and it felt heavy and it just sucked me straight into the rocks and it cut me off. And so I was, I was super bummed. So it was like five fish in a row. And then that, that sixth one just dove straight down. I'm like, dude, what was that? So I got another lucky craft on, tied it on real quick, cast it back out there and I got bit again. Um, and, and then, it, you know, stripping out drag, it wasn't as heavy, but I, and I saw him surfacing and I saw him flush. I'm like, yo, is is that a white sea bass? Like, I didn't even know, you know, like I've only seen pictures on my computer. I've never caught one before on a boat or anywhere, you know? And so, um, yeah, I saw, I saw it and I'm like, dude, I think that's a white sea bass. Oh, and I was just, I was pissing my pants, you know, like, dude, I think, and it was a good size. Like, um, it was a good size. So I was, yeah. Um, I was only using 10 pound fluoro, um, which is kind of crazy too. Cause there's so much, so much rocks where I was at, but I was able to land them. It was a white sea bass and, um, but it was a little short. It was like 27 inches. 
Um, and so I just let him go, but you know, I had to go back <laughs> and, and fish that beach. And you caught that the like, next day or, um, no, I think it was, you know, it might've been a couple weeks after. Okay. Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe even three weeks after. So, um, I mean, clearly they were hold there. They were holding there. You know, I don't know if that's traditionally a place where people catch them. Um, but yeah, I, I went back. Um, it's a long drive for me. It's probably like with traffic over an hour for me to get to. So, um, but I think we would all make that drive <laughs> if, <laughs> if we knew I had a chance. So, uh, went down there and then this time I was by myself and, um, I was again, like not targeting white sea bass, but targeting halibut. Cause that's a known place for halibut. And I was tossing the lucky craft again and I was getting skunked for about two and a half hours. And I walked probably about a hundred yards of sand. Um, and I was about to finish up. I'm like, yo, I'm not getting bit today. Let's move spots. And uh, I just saw, uh, I just saw fishy water, you know, um, mm-hmm. it just looked like an area where something might be holding. So I'm like, dude, let's just, let's just make a couple more casts. So I went over, made a cast, got bit and I was just stoked to get a bite. Cause you know, if you're getting skunked for two hours, <laughs> it's, it's just not a good feeling. So I was just stoked. I thought it was just something small. Um, next thing you know, I started stripping line out and I didn't have my GoPro on cause I was just, wasn't catching anything. Um, uh, flipped, fumbled my, th- fumbled the GoPro on and next thing you know, it just starts stripping out line. And, um, uh, yeah, it just, it took me out, probably took, it took me almost to my braid. Um, and I'm like, dude, this is, this is a good fish guys. Like this is a good fish. And, um, and so, yeah, I was, he took a, maybe two really long runs and then like a couple of shorter runs um and the water wasn't that clear so i couldn't see it for the longest time and uh and then when he came up and i and i was beaching him i was like oh my god what is it was so like at least for me you know like from the surf you don't normally see fish that size and i'm like oh and i just saw the spot um on his side he has a little dark spot so i thought it was a world record spot fin croaker um, like on a, on a, on my first reaction, I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's a world record spot fin. Um, a world record spot fin is 27 inches and this thing was way bigger. So I was like, Oh my gosh, it's a, it's a world record spot fin. And then I looked at it again. I'm like, no, that's a ghost. Oh my gosh. So, um, taped him out. It was conservatively a 32. Um, I think maybe 33 if you want, if I wanted to stretch it. Um, but yeah, it was, I mean, I'm s- super stoked, super grateful, you know? Um, I don't think it's every day you can catch a legal white sea bass from the surf. So, absolutely. So you said ten pound fluoro. Do you have a different like setup for when you use the artificial when you use the lucky craft, or do you just throw on a heavier leader on that lower main line? Yeah, I'm I'm crazy, and you know, again, like my background is light line surf fishing. Yeah. And so, like, I I just kind of go up from there. So I'm not really geared up for the heavy stuff. Um, and you know, to me, like ten pound is enough if you want to catch like legal halibut. Um, especially if you're just in sandy areas. Um, but I kind of fell into this, this beach that had a lot of, lot of rocks on it. So, um, 10 pound is, a, is stretching it. It's, it, it can handle the fish. It just can't handle the rocks. If that makes any sense. No, it makes um, perfect sense. You know, like floor like, is just really not that abrasion resistant. Right. Right. And so that's another reason why I use the line that I use just for the abrasion resist- resistance, you know, but, um, 10 pounds enough, but I think like, Probably 12 would be better, maybe 15 if you want to feel safe. Um, and I know guys use more. Um, I've talked to guys that um, fish areas where they're catching, you know, 40, 35 inch to 40 inch halibut and, you know, they get sawed off, you know, and, and so they use exclusively 20 to 25. Um, so, you know, if I lose a fish like that, that'll probably make me learn my lesson. But <laughs> And you, you uh, backfill it? You're always using a little bit of braid in the back? Right. Braid monofloro kind of combination. Um, I just have braid floral. Oh, braid braid so, floral. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I just have a braid backing. Um, I'll probably put about fifty to sixty yards of, and again, it's like super light. I put ten pound. <laughs> yeah. Um, ten pound backing, maybe about fifty, sixty yards. Um, and then yeah, and then I'll top shot it with probably a good like eighty to one hundred yards of whatever floor I'm using. Yeah. Oh, cool. Do you have a favorite knot to can? to join them together do you like uni to uni or john collins what kind of knot do you like yeah so i started off with the royal polaris um it the rp i i've i learned it as the rp and Mm -hmm. it looks and then later on i looked at it and i think it's the same thing as the albright and so people can 
correct me if I'm wrong, if the Albright and the RP knot are just two different names of the same thing. But so I, that's what I started tying the connection knots with. Um, lately, I've just been doing uni to uni. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, it turns out I think that's a little bit faster and more efficient. Yeah. Dude, mad props for getting that white sea bass from the shore, though. That's crazy. Uh, I've seen they, some guys get them in like Palos Verdes from the rocks and they like bomb them out into the kelp kind of thing uh-huh. and then hopefully get it. But you're like one of the first guys who, keep, who consistently has gotten one from the surf on light wine tackle. Right, <laughs> so right. You're the yeah. ghost slayer, the sandy ghost slayer. I know, it's crazy. You know, a couple of my friends are like, oh, you're the you're the ghost hunter. And I just laugh, man. But um, hey, it's a product of time on the water, right? Um, time Absolutely. on the water and putting the odds in your favor. So I'll definitely take it. <laughs> so let's switch over to a little bit about how you got started with your YouTube channel. Like, Is there any lessons learned from trying to build a community on there and maybe have has everybody been pretty welcoming or any haters or how does, how does that whole thing work? Yeah. Um, so I made the decision to do it. Um, and I think one of the things that prevented me from starting my YouTube channel earlier was just knowing that as you grow, there are going to be haters. Um, and I'm a people pleaser. I can be sensitive. So it's not something that I really like dealing with. You know, I think as I've gotten older, my, my skin's gotten a little thicker. But once I was able to process that, I read a couple books on how to how to do a YouTube and just you know things like that. And um, and once I I started when I was ready to to deal with hate, you know. Once I accepted the fact that hey, this whole social media thing, if you are if you ever end up becoming a person of relevance or you know something that you're growing to a place where people know you, dude, you're gonna get hate. And if you're not getting hate, then you're not very big, right? So um, it just comes with the territory. Um, people have been, it hasn't been bad, um, which means I still need to grow, in my opinion, you know? Like, I think, like, if it goes a long, if I go a long time without a negative comment or something that's challenging, like challenging feedback, then I'm like, oh, I might not, I must not be growing fast enough, right? So that's, um, but not not too much, um, not too much negativity yet. Here, a couple I've had um, um, in the online world, but that's just social media. And so I think with social media, um, it comes with the territory. And I think, I think, I think what's worked for me. And again, I'm not someone that's grown to whatever ten thousand followers overnight. I, you know, I'm with Instagram. I'm like at thirteen hundred now. But um, it's oh, what was I going to say? Crap. <laughs> Um, yeah, obviously like, like the, the haters come with the territory and, um, for me, like what's, what I think has worked for me has, you just got to treat everyone the best you can, um, be kind. Um, what I didn't know about social media prior to this past year is it's the same thing as real life relationships. Um, it's just, you're, you're just doing it over, over the world wide web. You know, it, it's the same exact thing. And I didn't expect that. I didn't know that, um, it, that it's all about relationships. And so I think that's how I met you. You know, I, I, you know, I, I think, I think I'm, I most likely probably added you, um, on Instagram, but then, you know, started, we were able to start messaging each other and, um, you know, like it's just about that, that relationship. And Dude, we um, have the exact same, same outlook on social media. It's, it really mm-hmm. does. It's great that everybody talks about the negative, but the positives are, are there if you just yeah. look for them and you're right. It's right. like the network, the cool lessons learned that you get to just share with different people it's been the most important thing like i've met a whole bunch of cool guys i've actually taken trips like to baja with people that i've met just on you know you're just like i would never have done that never have thought about doing that how do you find people most of the time you can't you know it's not like you're gonna just gonna go to the library or something and you just meet somebody it's like it's i don't know it's it's pretty powerful and amazing tool it's been it's been the coolest thing because i started fishing because i loved it and it was for myself right it was cathartic it was therapeutic and um, I never expected that through fishing I would meet friends. But in the past two years, I've met probably the people, the friends that I interact with the most in my life now are from fishing and from through social media and through like my Facebook group. You know, that's where I've met the most amount of people in the past. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, so I totally agree with you. So my question is, how do you differentiate yourself on, say, like YouTube? Because, you know, there's a lot of guys who are probably following, you know, the... Um, outdoor chef life or fisherman's life kind of catch and cook style thing um mm-hmm. but yeah i mean i think there's so much more to fishing than than just catch yeah. and cook so my question is like yeah. how do you look at the platform how are you going to like kind of differentiate yourself in 2020 yeah yeah 
That's a good question. Um, I, and I think differentiating myself is important. Um, at the same time, I haven't taken that approach. It's, I think from what I've read and I tend to agree with, and it makes sense to me is to be the best version, be, to be the most authentic version of myself and to make sure that that's what's shown, you know? And secondly, um, Secondly, it's a constant reminder on social media and YouTube and any social media platform is um, it's not to showcase what a great fisherman I am because then um, my YouTube would fail because I'm not that good. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's not to showcase, oh, yeah, look at me and fluff my feathers and, and show off like these amazing catches. Um, it has, I think, my YouTube channel hopefully and has to add value to the person watching to the person watching it. And so if it is entertainment, you know, which is cat, you know, I only make videos that are in my opinion, quality fish, right? And it might not be quality for everyone, but if it's something that I believe is a quality, hard to catch fish, I'll, I'll make it. I'm not gonna just post every week with, you know, cause I caught a mackerel, you know, on a session, you know, like I'll never do that. And there are guys that do, and that's part of what, you know, they're just constantly pumping out videos. So I like to do quality content and um and yeah offering value so i do make a decent amount of how to's um and most of the how to's are with corbina because it's just what i'm best at and i feel like that's it's a niche category of fishing that i would love to see grow and flourish and become more popular and so um you know i, I make the how to videos just to be of service because there are a lot of people out there that are always that are still like dude i have never caught a corbina you know and so um if if I can offer that service to people that want to watch, um, dude, that's stoked. I'd be so stoked. Yeah. Do you ever take anybody out? Do, do, do anybody hit you up and be like, hey, man, take me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah um, for sure. Um, several, um, definitely through my Facebook group, um, through California Surf Anglers, um, people, now that this past year I've been able to, you know, post some decent catches on there, you know, um, and so people – are like oh you're so good and it's like i kind of laugh but um but yeah they hit me up and can we fish so i fished with several people from that group and i've actually i've actually fished with um a handful of people from youtube too um people that have hit me up from there and and they seem nice i just got to make sure go through my own like um inner vetting process to make sure that you know it's someone i feel safe meeting up with you know yeah and, absolutely um, but I'm more than I'm more than happy to do that, and I think that's part of the relationship. That's part of what we do, right? It's it's not just putting things on video, but it's like, yo, I welcome you into this community, and you're taking your time, which is limited, to engage with me. Like, dude, I'd love to give back if I can, you know? Yeah. Didn't you go down to Cabo and hang out with uh, Cabo Surf Caster? Yeah. Yeah, man. That's, Dude, hitting up yeah. rooster fish or something? What was that about? <laughs> Um, I had seen Wesley, um, the Cabo surf caster on YouTube. And I think almost everyone has probably seen his YouTube because his videos are so sick. So I had seen them years ago and it was always a dream for me to like, so since I saw his video from years ago, I'm like, dude, I would love to catch a rooster. And he makes it seem so easy. Right. Cause it's like, YouTube's a, a highlight reel. It's like, dude, this guy's just catching them like left and right. And so, yeah, last year we booked a vacation, family vacation to Cabo and, uh, with the, intent of me spending a morning with Wesley okay. yeah so booked him and he was available and uh, me and my boy my seven-year-old um, went out with him in the morning and um, yeah turns out it's not that easy man <laughs> um, they have to be there right it's, it's surf fishing you were, were literally casting from the surf uh, so yeah I was, I was skunking like the whole morning probably about four hours and my back we were using 12 foot long rods um, I was gonna say you had to bomb those surface lures out there like a distance yeah. right and then you're pulling you're reeling that sucker in fast like constantly right yeah it's a workout um, there's different yeah I mean I had to ask him like what's the best way to work the lure but they're you know these big old like three ounce stick baits three four ounce stick baits that you're you're chucking out there um, yeah so probably at four hours and I was just I mean dude you know, we went all the way to Cabo, so I was just casting maniacally, you know, like just, just trying to get a bite. Um, four, and at probably at like the four hour mark. Yeah, it was probably about four hours. Um, yeah, I dunk, and I got, I, I, I'm like, oh, dude, I'm on. <laughs> and, uh, and then Wesley comes over and he guided me through the whole thing. And, um, yeah, it ended up being, it ended up being a 50 pound rooster fish. 50 um, pounds, man. Yeah, it was <laughs> uh, that. And again, like, dude, it was, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Wesley was there, um, and his uh, videographer was there, and his videographer was like, "Yeah, that's that's the biggest one that we've seen caught that that has been caught up to that year, you know." Um, so I know they're not always that big either, you know. So just like super lucky and grateful to have had that fish decide to bite my lure. <laughs> that's impressive. Did you get that on film? Is that on your YouTube as well, or? It is. It is. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's one of my favorite episodes. Um, and I, again, it was newer. It was still when I was newer to my channel, so I didn't really, you know, but I'm proud of it, you know? And yeah, so that's definitely on my channel. That's cool. So I'll put a, a link to Wesley's stuff in the show notes so people can find that because that stoke is real. <laughs> he's, yeah, he has dude. some crazy, not just rooster fish. He's pulling mahi. He's pulling whatever. Yep. Baja is yeah, a ma- magical place, man. So it's like, right. right. And you, 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 uh, you, uh, uh, dive down there too, right? Yeah. I haven't dove in Cabo per se. I've, okay. I've dove in, um, pretty much Bay of LA and turtle Bay area. So one's on in the sea of Cortez, one's on the Pacific side. Uh, those are the two general spots that I go, but, um, I like I like Mexico. I've been to Tulum. Um, I've okay. spearfished in Tulum, but it's okay. crazy because you go down there and, and it's almost like an aquarium. Like <sighs> whereas like you dive here uh, in Southern California, it's it's nice. I mean, you see calico, sheephead. You see different kinds of perch near the the reef. If you get lucky and you're in Catalina, you'll see like um, white sea bass or yellowtail. But then when you go down to Baja, it's just like grouper, yellowtail. They're monsters. Oh, yeah. They're they're tornadoing you. It's like yeah snapper this that whatever you want trigger fish <laughs> parrot fish it's like holy cow man <laughs> it's amazing it's another yeah you gotta come down with me to baja one of these times to blow heck your yeah. mind heck yeah i'm down man <laughs> well, sick man do you have any uh resources for people um any good books that you like to read or people they should reach out to as well um, the, so the book that kind of started me down the road of surf fishing and specifically light line surf fishing was a book by Bill Varney and it's called the light line surf revolution, I believe. Um, and I just saw it at a tackle at my local tackle shop and I'm like, Oh, this looks helpful and, um, opened it up and I uh, purchased it and, and that's what got me started. Um, and so that's, that's a good resource. I think you could probably find it on Amazon. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah. And so, um, I think Bill is definitely kind of in some ways the pioneer of light line surf fishing, um, at least in terms of name value. I don't know, um, in terms of like all the politics behind it, but he definitely is a, some, a name that most of us identify with. Have you fished with him yet? I haven't. I, um, I've been in contact with him. Um, and so I don't think he's, I don't think he's local now. I think he moves in and out of state and I'm not trying to speak for you, Bill, but, um, but yeah, so my, my CPA actually used to office with him. Um, and so that's how I got the connection. And so I, we emailed a few times back and forth and, um, I think we follow each other on Facebook. So, um, yeah, every once in a while he'll pop in and make a comment and everyone be like, Oh my gosh, did Bill Varney just comment? (laughs) (laughs) It's funny because I was, I was reading this magazine. I don't know if you've seen it before. Fish taco. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think he has some, I think he's one of the contributors to that. So I was like, oh, oh. that name sounds very familiar. And I actually think I'm on his surf fishing newsletter that comes out go. from time to time. Have you, are you on that as well? Um, I'm not on the newsletter, but I've been on the website. Okay, cool. Um, but I just, I sometimes I forget about it. And so, but yeah, and I know, I think I, from what I understand, he and Wesley are good friends too. So. Oh, it's crazy how small yeah. this community is, man. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love how it, like so many things are connected. Yeah, absolutely, dude. <laughs> well, so how can people find you if they want to to reach out? Yeah, so my primary platforms are my YouTube and Instagram. Um, Instagram at Benji Kim Fishing, and that's probably where I'm most active at. And you know, I I haven't been posting as much lately because of the rain, but I try to be active on there throughout the week um, with regular posts. Um, and then on my YouTube at Benji Kim Fishing. So those are my two main platforms. And uh, January 2020 is a goal for me to get my website up, and um, that'll be at benjikimfishing.com. Um, but I'm, I'll am i probably need to pick your brain, and I'm working with some other people to help me out with it because I'm very website illiterate. <laughs> so I'm um, looking to launch in that side, um, that up in early 2020 and get that rolling out too. Well, whatever I can do to help, man, just let me know. And then the, yeah, the last question I'd like to ask is, um, and I know you touched on it a little bit in the beginning, but... Why do you fish? Um, oh, dude. So many different reasons. Um, 
I, I fish because, okay, I fish um, on a personal level. I fish because it's therapeutic for me. Um, I think when on a day-to-day, week-to-week grind, um, the everyday life, even the stuff I love, my family, um, you know, the responsibilities and all that stuff, um, I think when I when I hit the water and my feet hit the sand, um, something changes in my brain and in just the way I feel. And um, no one wants to skunk, but even if you're having a bad day of fishing, um, it really clears my mind. Um, and so it's just, uh, I, I found it to be extremely health, uh, extremely healthy and positive, um, activity for me personally. Um, secondly, it's just another way to give back and to serve. Um, it's just a context and whatever we're doing, I do believe that we're called to serve and to make other people's lives better, um, happier, um, make this world a positive place. And so it's just the vehicle that I'm able to do something that I'm passionate about to hopefully, um, leave it more positive than where I found it, you know, um, and to just be helpful and kind because, um, come on, man, like this world is a brutal place. It can get pretty ugly, you know, and it can get nasty and we're all, all of us are dealing with things in our personal lives, you know, um, it's hard. And so, um, for it to be a respite for myself as well as for my fellow anglers. Oh man, I love it. Really appreciate that answer and keep giving us the stoke, man. Keep catching those <laughs> cool fish. Best. <laughs> Do my best, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. All right, guys. If you made it this far through the video, I'm going to be doing a surprise giveaway, and it's going to be valid for only the day that this video is released. So check the date right below. That's the only day that this giveaway is going to be valid for. So what we're going to do is for the first three people who email me, I'm going to send out a Lucky Craft. It could be any pattern. One of them might be this pattern. This is my favorite pattern right now. It's been super hot. It's a limited edition Super Glow MK, MS MKB from Lucky Craft. It's the 110. But I'll be sending them out to the first three people who email me who are able to find and watch this video. Just a fun little thing to show my appreciation for you guys. So all you need to do is like the video, leave a comment not related to this Easter egg, just a random comment um, about the podcast or anything you want like and comment, subscribe and bell if you haven't done so already, send me an email to benjikimfishing at gmail.com and the first three that I get, the first three responses that I get, I'll be sending out a random Lucky Craft. This is just a thank you from me to you guys. I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you so much. Good luck.